obviously um playing music uh and focusing on that i didn't really focus on school so i my, my gpa was obviously terrible i think i got like a one point something at one 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 semester uh, it was really bad but i was playing music and you know i was the one who did the flyers and i did the websites and i did all that other stuff and um I actually just post somebody posts on LinkedIn about their first website and I just put a link to on LinkedIn some of those comments for like my very first website I designed in 2002 um it, it for my Weezer cover band Tweezer uh it oh. was really bad but uh anyway so I've come a long way since then uh anyway so you know what's interesting though is you know your friends bands they need websites and they need CDR and they know so so I started actually you know doing these really bad websites and flyers looking back on it now they're really bad at the time I thought they were great um, but you know, for literally a hundred bucks, maybe a six pack of beer or something, you know, I thought I was doing really well. Um, so anyway, I started doing freelance, making a little bit of money, but still, you know, kind of going to school. I was going to school for economics because, um, mm -hmm. I don't know why I just picked it because I, my GPA was so bad. I couldn't get into the business school. So I had to pick another business -y related thing because that's what my if family. I all ask another question too, because yeah. you said you got into freelancing when you were in college. Mm -hmm. How did that exactly start? Did it start from the, somebody seeing like your work in like websites or yeah, did you just, I was that, playing music. Get it, might as well do it. Yeah, I was in bands, right? And so my, yeah. we would, you know, put the flyers up and people like, oh, who did your flyer? Like, oh, I did, you know, or, or we did the website and people like, oh, who did your website? Like, oh, I did. Like, oh, we need a website. Can you do our website? And started doing that, you know, so I would do it in Photoshop and like export the tables and stuff from Photoshop. <laughs> like, <laughs> like back in the day, it was, it was very bad. Uh, and I mean, know. a lot of people underestimate the the word of mouth effect that that can yeah, have, exactly. you know, like, oh, who, who did that for you? Oh, it was this guy over here. And then that just, that exactly. snowballs one thing exactly. into another, you know? So yeah, exactly. good on you. But I didn't really take it seriously. It was just sort of a thing I just would do for friends and stuff, you know, and never, I never tried to treat it like a business. Um, but anyway, uh, Katrina hit New Orleans and I was, you know, up there partying, not really doing much. And um, I, I I was going to economics. And one of the things, you, you know, you learn is like all these economic fallacies and these, these, these sort of cognitive fallacies. One of them is this idea of the sunk cost fallacy. And just because you go to school or you, just because you do something uh, doesn't mean you need to finish if you don't think you're actually going to, you know, do anything with it. Just it's a sunk yeah. cost and just give up. So anyway, I, did, I was like, you know what? Screw this. I'm done. Uh, and I dropped out of school um, and I ended up getting in another band down in New Orleans. You know, I can scroll a little bit and uh, a band called the Garden District. The singer Kevin was a an architect, graphic designer also on the side. And, you know, I was doing our website. So he's like, hey, we should do this, you know, instead of like hundred bucks. He's like, we could charge thousands, you know, and I'm like, all right, cool. <laughs> okay, so we started this, helpful. yeah, we started this, uh, oh, my graphics, OMG, you know, uh, was our, our side hustle. And we started doing, you know, websites for more like local stuff, restaurants. Uh, he worked in architecture, so he knew people that had architecture firms and things like that. So more like we got into more businessy stuff as opposed to just the silly kind of, you know, friends, local bands and stuff. Um, so then later on, um, I decided you know at some point i wanted to get a real job because waiting tables and stuff uh wasn't all that great but i you know back, and this is early you know like it's 2007 ish uh you know uh, people weren't really hiring people who didn't have degrees at that time so in order yeah. to get a job at ad agency like i had to get a degree so uh, i went back to tulane uh in new orleans and i did this uh honestly kind of a bs degree it was like digital design night school kind of stuff it was sort of like you know, one of those like uh, night schools that you would you would have seen like advertised on TV or something. But anyway, it got me a four year, you know, bachelor's degree. So I did that. And then I ended up getting a, a quote unquote real job at this little ad agency down in New Orleans. Um, and I was doing, uh, again, more really bad websites and a lot of WordPress sites. Uh, it, I didn't really learn a whole lot, but I guess I did learn, you know, like what I didn't want to do. Um, so then uh, I moved actually back in college but we started dating about this time and she was actually a graphic designer she went to, uh, lsu had a really good uh, graphic design program mm -hmm. and i wish i would have known about it back when i was doing all this stuff but i didn't uh i didn't you know i didn't really pay attention to school but anyway so she did uh bfa and a bachelor of fine arts and and she had a graphic design degree and when we started uh dating we started doing these like new orleans inspired t-shirts so you know we would do like art markets and stuff and then you know we also started doing more design freelance design because the guy kevin from the other previous uh freelance thing he decided he didn't want to do that anymore um and so my wife and i started doing it so we had our own freelance 
kind of thing. And again, you know, instead of a thousand, we were doing like five figures, you know, we were charging 10,000 for, for websites. And my wife actually did this full time for a little while. Um, so we ended up ask, yeah, go ahead. Too, yeah. what was one of your first gigs that you had with your wife when you had started off the web design? The first website or first or client? One of the first, yeah. One of the yeah. first clients. Oh man, I don't even remember. Our website's still up actually. Uh, this is our jam.com. So my oh, wife's name is Amy. It it's so bad, dude. My wife's name is Amy. So our initials are J-A-M, Jeremy Amy Miller. And oh, our, the name of the company was This Is Our Jam. Um, so anyway, uh, I don't remember the first client. It, it probably was like one of the restaurants. So I was I was working in the service industry, waiting tables, bartending. So I knew a lot of people in the service industry. A lot of people had restaurants and stuff. And so we ended up doing um, a lot of restaurants. If you're familiar with New Orleans, there's a street called Magazine Street. And at mm -hmm. one point, a lot of restaurants and bars. And at one point, we had like almost two blocks worth of just all the restaurants, like on those two blocks um, with all the, you know, they were all our clients and stuff. So we were doing pretty good. Um, and then uh, let's see. Yeah. So we did that. And then um, I got kind of sick of advertising and I wanted to sort of get into UX. And about 2011, um, I got, I put my quotes, <laughs> a quote, UX job. Uh, working at this startup and we were doing a bunch of SaaS products and a lot of this we ended up doing really I didn't realize it at the time but more enterprise stuff yeah um, and so we had a couple clients here and one of them that I remember specifically I didn't think about it at the time but I, I thought about it later um, was this application that we built for a, it was called the uh, back office something i can't remember the name of it but it was uh, a back office application for law firms and the idea was this law this law firm they wanted to build this piece of software and then sell it as a SaaS app to other law firms so it would manage all the cases so you think about the cases you know there's tons of stuff like receipts and and dates and contacts and notes and documents and like all these things uh and sometimes these cases can last a year or two years and sometimes people are actually hopping back on and off of these cases especially at the big law firms so you know they needed a way to track all this stuff and this this software is actually still around today they completely changed the name and rebranded it since since i was on it but um i think it's called like docket or something like that now but anyway um oh, I've heard this of was, docket, actually too that yeah, seems very familiar i think it's docket don't hold me on that i have to go look it up yeah. and see but anyway actually the SaaS company the, the startup i work for that law firm actually bought the startup and they became the in-house SaaS or the team for the SaaS company. So that's all they do now is that one app. Anyway, um, I don't know if it's docket. I have to look it up. Anyway, um, that was like my first taste of like enterprise. And I really love that, like, you know, working with people that are doing this for work, helping them to make their job, uh, you know, more uh, more enjoyable, maybe enjoyable is the wrong word, but more effective, more efficient at their job. Um, so anyway, I did that and I put UX uh, in quotes and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second because I, I wasn't really doing all that great. So this is my first UX job, like I said, and I didn't really know much about it. I just started doing it. And it's funny because at the time I but thought I was doing know, an amazing job. You know, back, end, back then UX wasn't really pronounced and nobody was really right. sure what to call it at the time. So exactly. it's not yeah, I mean, a consult that you didn't know at the point. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you think about 2011, I mean, that was before Google launched Material. That was before they took design really seriously. You know, this was really Apple was like one of the only big companies doing this. Um, so anyway, uh, my wife and I, uh, we had gotten married somewhere in here. I didn't put that in here, but we had gotten married and uh, we, you know, wanted to start having kids. And the startup, I was making nothing. I was making well, nothing. I was making like forty five thousand dollars a year, which, you know, even 10 years ago was was not a whole lot for 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 that kind of stuff. I didn't have any benefits. That's, really That's not enough. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, we were like, hey, we need to have kids. I need a 401k. I need retirement. I need all this stuff. So I went back to one of the ad agencies in New Orleans and I um, I actually applied to the same agency somewhere around here um, when I was trying to go to this other, get my actual ad agency job as a designer. And they didn't hire me uh, because my portfolio was terrible. But they, I was also doing front end development through this whole time as well, building websites and things. So I went back to this big ad agency as a developer, actually. And I remember the day specifically. I remember it. I was building a website, all right, an email for a bank customer. And they had some new like certificate of deposit, which is, you know, like a savings account. And it was like a 2% CD or something, which was like <laughs> nothing. It's like less than inflation. And uh, we were sending out this email. And I remember looking at the analytics and it was like, I don't know, 20,000, 30,000 people. I don't remember how many people, but like thousands of people on this email list. And out of all the people in the email, 
5% opened them or something, 3% opened it. And out of those 5%, only like five or 3% of those people actually clicked on anything to go to the website and the email thing, this campaign that we're building. And I just remember thinking like, what is the fucking point? What is, what am I doing with myself? This is such a miserable job. I hate this so much. Um, and I got really lucky actually, because at the time, um, one of the guys had, uh, I was working with as a developer had left to go to GE Power. And then yeah. like one by one, we all started talking to him like, hey, how's this? And he's like, man, we're making like almost 100K. It's great. You know, it was like double my salary. And uh, one by one, you know, GE just sort of poached like everybody from this ad agency software team, even the UX designers as well. So um, anyway, I, uh, you know, started <laughs> talking to them and I got a job at GE as a UX designer. Um, and I also didn't think I was that great as, of a front end developer, to be perfectly honest. I, didn't, I wasn't really great with JavaScript and all that stuff. But uh, so anyway, I started working at G Power, and and this is where I put quotes. And if I have in the one question for you too. Yeah, you came from web design to like software developer. Like, how did that transgress? You making that? Well, I know. Software directly that way, and then eventually got into CMS like WordPress development and custom, you know, WordPress sites and things like that. Okay. Yeah. So, so when I got to GE Power, we had a huge UX team. Um, in New Orleans, we had, I think we had like 10 or 15 UX designers in New Orleans. And then we also had UX designers in, in California and Atlanta and some other places. So we had a big UX team. And it was at this place where I realized, like, well, I thought I was doing UX before, but I had no idea. Like, uh, you know, when I say I was doing UX before, like, you know, I had a really bad case like Dunning-Kruger. Like, I thought I knew everything and I, I had no idea. I didn't know half the crap that I, you know, didn't actually know. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I never really talked to users. I'd never done user research, you know. <laughs> I never did validation. I didn't use usability studies. Um, it was literally just taking a stand. We did waterfall at the at the startup. We, we weren't even we weren't even pretending to do agile. We were literally doing waterfall. Um, I would mm -hmm. get a stack of requirements and I would just design the wireframes and the, the mockups and stuff based on those, um, you know, uh, those those requirements. And we never talked to a single user. It wasn't user centered at all. Uh, and it wasn't until I got to GE that I realized I, I wasn't actually doing it right. Um, so I started off there. I feel like if I can ask a question, you kind yeah. of experience like a shock like when it comes to like building websites from beforehand you're more like building for a need compared to like now when it comes to GE products to just like no we have to get the user input like how was that transition how did you handle that too I just went with the flow, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, know. Uh, I mean I didn't tell anybody at GE that I like didn't actually know what I was doing because when I interviewed I thought I did uh, and maybe the hiring process wasn't all that great because nobody asked me about usability studies. Nobody asked me about user interviews. Nobody asked me about personas and empathy maps and all that stuff. Um, so, you know, I don't know. Maybe I, maybe maybe they didn't know as much as I thought they knew either. But, uh, yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I just sort of adapted, you know, flexible, went, went changed with whatever I needed to change, you know. I don't, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, I mean, even, you know, like we were saying, like nobody really had like empathy maps and affinity maps and all that kind of stuff back mm -hmm. then. So just to hear the company come out now, like, hey, you have to research your users so we can mm -hmm. actually build out a product. And you're just kind of like, yeah, I know. I know what that mm -hmm. is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I started doing uh, working at G Power and I've got like G Power Digital Aviation. So uh, GE, you know, is a big giant corporation and people always hopped around from, from company to company within the larger company. Uh, so we had, you know, big, big power center in New Orleans, big, big um, for GE Power. And then GE Digital came along. And what the interesting thing about GE Digital was they were trying to be a software company. They were actually trying to be a software company. If you talk to Power or any aviation or any of the other companies at the time, they were like, we're a manufacturing company. We just need we need software to, to support the manufacturing process or the things that we build. GE Digital came along and they were like, we're actually going to be a software company. We're going to sell software to other industrial uh, companies. 
And so um, it started to think, they started to think a lot more about like product and SaaS kind of comp, which was good because it was very similar to a lot of the things that I was doing before at the startup, but actually fit a lot with what my experience was. Um, but anyway, so I started working on this big team for this uh, piece of software that was built to manage the uh, jet engine and gas turbine component repair process. Oh, wow. So if you, if you think about like a gas turbine and a jet engine, they're actually very similar pieces of machinery uh, air comes in compresses the air there's some ignition you know the thing turns um, and either it turns to you know turn a dynamo to create power or it turns to create thrust for a jet so uh, anyway very similar pieces of technology uh, and so we were building this this piece of software to manage that component repair process uh, which is again really cool because we had you know two big customers we had digital sorry we had aviation and power um, that were you know really needing the same things so we thought a lot about you know feature flags and you know uh, how we could build you know scalable features so that we could turn things and and on and off and stuff it was really really interesting but but this is really cool because this is where I started to lead this team I had a team in, in Budapest and in Hungary I had some people in California and New Orleans and stuff so starting to actually like lead a team here which is really cool if uh, I was to ask a um, question, would you say mm -hmm. from then you kind of got a bit more experience in like the engineering field, just kind of seeing how that technology really interacts with like the gas turbine engines and everything like that? You know, we never really, I mean, even to this day, we don't really deal a lot with the engineers doing the work of designing the actual machines. Um, you know, my work now actually is more closely related to that because it's it's dealing more as like a systems Kind of thinking as an architect um mm -hmm. but back then you know it was really just getting requirements from some product team or, or doing the discovery we actually did a lot of research trips and i got to travel around to shops and go actually talk to users and stuff um you know doing the component repair but not so much like the engineers it was more like people just inspecting stuff in this particular okay. case some people may yeah. have but so I, I didn't in my particular role but this is where i started to learn a lot about how important relationships are how difficult software is to actually you know get built it's not one of the things where like you can just come in as a ux designer and say i designed the most amazing thing now go build it or you're a dummy you know you have to go in with like all these other people and and sell this idea and and and, and really articulate why this was the right approach and a lot of times you know big companies like this you everybody thinks they have the right idea right nobody's ever written not i mean some people maybe but most of the time people aren't malicious they just think their ideas are good and so everybody's mm -hmm. got ideas right i mean ux design has an idea product team has ideas engineers have ideas stakeholders have ideas so it's all mm -hmm. about like selling selling this and and this is where i started to learn about all that stuff so about 2020 so, oh yeah go ahead if i could ask a question because we did have a question from earlier with karina uh in the chat she asks because we were talking about it a bit because you know in the beginning like 2011 nobody really knew what ux design was you just started as like basic design mm -hmm. so she asks what's the difference you between ux design then and now and yeah. how entry-level designers break in this industry with no experience at all so if i was to like paraphrase it um how would you rate the experience between ux designers from back when you started at the very beginning to now and how would you say like somebody entry level would have handled that? I mean, it's hard to say as the, for the industry as a whole, I can tell you from my perspective, being in a very small market like New Orleans, where, you know, at the time it was all, you know, no remote jobs and everything was in sight, but there was no, there were no big companies, you know, New Orleans is a very small market. So it's not like we were out in San Francisco or New York or the Bay area or something or, or Silicon Valley where you actually had maybe people who were more, you know, more aligned to what people would think of as UX. Um, so in New Orleans, you know, um, very much detached from some of that stuff. So it was, you know, the people who were doing the web design tended to be the people who design web apps. You know, it was sort of like a, a natural progression for some of us, I think, back then. Um, you know, because if I can kind of think about some of the clients we had, it was like, oh, well, we need a website to do a thing. And nobody really thought of it as a web app. Nobody thought of it as software. You know, it was we have a website, we need to sell something. Or we have a website, we want somebody to save something or upload something or whatever. And from their perspective at the time, you know, they're just thinking it's a website. Because from their, from, at, at the time, application meant installable, executable file, right? Yeah. which is a very different type of software engineering than creating stuff with JavaScript and, you know, maybe, you know, I don't know, whatever kind of backend code you would use, like C or C sharp or something like that. Right. 
Mm -hmm. So um, I think for us, it was really that progression of websites to web apps. Yeah. It's kind sense. of more like the we might as well because <laughs> we started mm -hmm. to might as well go forward with that. You know. Yeah. And that startup that I worked, we we never we did a couple of mobile applications, but they were they were really web apps wrapped in like a phone gap wrapper that we just submitted to the app store. They were still really web apps, you know. We didn't really do any like native applications. Mm -hmm. Um I hope that answers that question. And then there was a second part. What was the second part of that question? I guess it's also piggybacking off of the first. So Karina also asks. And how would an entry level UX designer breaking in the industry from back then compare to now? Yeah, well, I think it was a lot easier because there wasn't the influx of thousands and thousands and thousands of designers. You know, yeah. back then you may have, at least in New Orleans, right? You, you may have had five people who said they were UX designers. So I think the difference now is the demand and the popularity and the, just the influx of people. There's the competition is like insanely high, which changes how it changes how um, particular companies can be. Yeah. Right? And especially I mean, now, since we have so many people coming out of boot camps and also doing training certificates and everything, it's mm -hmm. way harder compared to when you hit the ground running in the beginning, I would think. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, but then people were like, well, I guess we have to give them a chance because we don't have anybody else, <laughs> you know, whereas now they have the pick of the litter. They can literally pick from not just somebody in the city, anywhere, anywhere around the world. You know, you can yeah, do this definitely. job from anywhere. And back then it was like, you know, we want someone in the office. So I guess, honestly, I feel like I got lucky. I don't I don't know if my experience then would get me a job now if 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 the timing were different, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. You know, well, I feel like as, even as a web guy. designer, you had a lot of convertible skills anyway. So you would have definitely got into the branch because you've been doing like the whole coding, like JavaScript and CSS um, mm -hmm. back then. So it would have been a bit easier. I'd say. Yeah, maybe. I, I'm not really sure. I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Uh, let's see. Where was it? All right. So um, about 2020, um, this is when I switched to this sort of architect role. And I, I left that MRO, the, the maintenance repair overhaul component repair thing I was doing and started looking at external presence. And the idea with this role was if you think about what an architect does, a lot of people probably aren't really familiar with it, but it's more systems thinking. It's more service design. And if you think about service design, it's, it's less about the interface and it's more about the end-to-end -end experience that exists outside of a specific application. So in the case of, you know, think of like a, a grocery store, right? Like you're going to the grocery store and maybe there's, you know, I, I have a Kroger down the street from my house. So I shop at Kroger a lot. They have an app where I can go and I can mark my coupons, right? I can like get yeah. digital coupons. So you have like an interface designer, product designer working on that app, but there's a larger system there. There's the billboards that inspire me to want or make me want to go shop at Kroger. There's the, the coupons that I get in the mail. There's the, the interface for, you know, buying or, or the, the POS system, right? That then connects to all these things. And, you know, all of that stuff happening. I go walk into the store, you know, I, I, I enter my, my member number or whatever, my phone number, that then sends to a database. It tells them what I bought. Somebody pr creates a process to send me coupons. That gets sent to a printer. The printer then prints it. Someone has to mail it. I get it in my house and I get coupons for the thing that I bought a week or two ago because now they know, they think, you know, there's an algorithm somewhere that says like, Jeremy's like more likely to go buy this because he bought it last week or two weeks ago. He's probably running low now, right? Yeah. All of that stuff and how all those systems connect is more of what like a, a you know a, a a systems kind of thinking or a service designer would probably would, would tend to do. So that's sort of what like an architect does. A lot less like visual design and more about how all the things connect and and really just like it says, architecting that overall experience that a customer would have. Um, oh. Would you say like being a UX architect is like a combination of just that coding side along with UX? There's like Come no on. coding at all, really, for me. And there's no design either, really. I mean, like if you think about design as like a visual design, like I'm not moving, you know, form fields around on a page, but it's a lot of designing the experience. Like I'm going to like if you think about the Kroger thing, right, there's somebody and there's a team somewhere who decides that we want to sell a thing. And somebody then would be in charge of saying, all right, well, you have these people, they live in this area, there's billboards, this place, or, or some other kind of ad that we could target them to get in. There's this, this system that maybe we could have a new way to send a new coupon, or we could do something else or whatever, you know, I, I mean, I, there could be like any number of things, but the architects really involved with like, 
planning a lot of that and how that works with the user. So less coding, there's certainly some technical piece in understanding about how systems connect, but it's not coding, you know, if that makes sense. Um, so anyway, about that same time, 2020, um, for Christmas, actually, when you're my wife got me a, a, a microphone, a USB microphone and a how to podcast book. <laughs> and she said, I'll never forget this. You like to complain about things. You'd make a great podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, thanks a lot. Uh, back, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyway, my, I kind of, you know, shoved it in my desk and drawer at work. And I was like, yeah, whatever. And then my buddy, Derek, who was on this uh, product with me, the one, the component repair, he was actually a systems architect, software architect. So, you know, again, like thinking about like planning the back end, how the services connect and all that crap. And we always worked really well together. We were actually friends before we started working at GE. New Orleans is a very small town. And uh, we started talking about relationships and importance, all this stuff. And we we're just like, dude, we should just start a podcast. Amy got me this microphone. You want to go like in a room and in a, in a, uh, we get a, a, a conference room and just like record if it sucks, we won't do anything with it. Um, and, uh, you know, so anyway, we ended up just like recording this, this episode one day and we're like, dude, that was a lot of fun. We should actually do this. So we started doing the podcast. And if you go listen to the, if you go to retro time podcast.com, um, there's the episode in there. I think it's like the, the title's MVP. That was like that episode that we recorded in the conference room that day. Uh, and you know, it's, it was terrible. It sounded awful, but it, we just started doing it. And then eventually, you know, we got some cool stuff. We've interviewed some really cool people. We interviewed Tom Graver, articulating design decisions, uh, Bob Martin, one of the guys who signed the, the agile manifesto. So that was really cool. We got to do that. Um, and then 2020, you guys are probably all aware of this, uh, COVID, uh, GE closed the office and then we had to move up to Cincinnati. Um, that's, that was, uh, you know, kind of a blessing in disguise. We actually have really enjoyed it up here. Um, but, uh, anyway, that was hard, obviously. Um, I want to ask another question too. How yeah, did you handle, you know, cause you started as a UX architect, like transitioning into just being, I would say virtual side only during that. How was that transition for you? Yeah, that was weird. I mean, I, cause I, I actually liked going in the office. I really enjoyed it. And I, I actually do kind of miss it a little bit. Um, it was weird, you know, and then the really thing that sucked about that was like, they were just like, yeah, we're just not going to come in on Monday. We'll, we'll keep the office closed for a couple of weeks. Uh, we'll let you know what happens. And then obviously you guys know how that went, you know, two weeks turned into two months, two months turned into almost two years. Um, and they laid everybody off and we didn't have, it was like no closure, you know, we didn't get to see anybody. We didn't get to have like a party or goodbye, you know, and, and everybody was, was, you know, in lockdown and, and uh, quarantining and stuff. So we didn't even really get to see each other. So it was like kind of crazy. Um, and then uh, being remote was hard, especially moving to Cincinnati and joining a completely new team where everybody was remote and I didn't get to meet most of the people for like a year after we moved, you mm. know, because we were, everybody was still kind of in lockdown and stuff up here. Um, yeah, I feel like everybody had this, that weird feeling of isolation where we didn't really mm -hmm. know what to do, but we still had to keep going because that's ultimately our jobs, right? But yeah. even yeah. so, if I was to relate, like uh, so much people that I've met before and um, initially when I'm like going to school or whatever, you see all these people online and just like, where's the human interaction? You know, it's mm -hmm. supposed to be about user testing and design and the user's experience, yet we're all through a screen. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and a lot of people, you know, I, I like to turn my camera on when I have meetings and stuff, but a lot of people don't, you know, and that's fine. Like, I don't want to like force anybody to turn the camera on, but there's certainly a lot of a lot of communication that happens non-verbally, you know, and so yeah. it just seeing words in the screen or listening to someone talk, you lose a lot of the body language, you use a lot of that other stuff, you know, it's really hard. It makes it makes building relationships hard. It makes building trust really hard. And if you don't have relationships and trust, it makes doing everything else related to software very, very, very hard. Mm. Um, so anyway, uh, so about, you know, 2020 ish, you know, everybody was kind of slow. The the work was kind of trickling in. And and uh, so I had a lot of time. <laughs> so I started doing mentoring on ADP list. Um, I actually was a was volunteering with this other group called Black Valley They're out of the UK. And I was um, I was mentoring with them. But they did like cohorts. So I had like one one person they would tie you with for like a, a quarter or so, eight weeks or so. And I would meet with them once a week. And I really enjoyed that. And then they stopped doing mentoring. I was like, well, I still want to do this. So I, that's how I found ADP list. Um, very different, obviously, you know, one-off kind of ad hoc sessions, but it's still really cool to like meet with people and talk about random stuff. Um, so I started doing that. That was really cool. 
the thing is, over the time, I noticed the same questions over and over and over again. People, you know, talking about networking or, or not being able to find a job. And I was given the same advice about networking and help with portfolios and or, or you know, diff- dealing with difficult engineers or difficult stakeholders, product owners, things like that. And I was like, you know, I was like, I'm saying the same thing all the time, constantly. I feel like there's an opportunity. People want to know this stuff. So that's why I started Beyond UX Design. Uh, podcast because like there's really me the same thing. You yeah, can just I just send here. you a link. Yeah, and yeah, exactly, there. exactly. Um, so you know, by the way, I don't do that. I still talk to people, but uh, you know, yeah. mostly, if you want to, if you like, check this podcast out. I, I talked about this, um, but yeah, so that was kind of how po- the podcast came about, and then ended up, you know, just doing more interviews and stuff because I ran out of ideas <laughs> for the for individual solo episodes. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, yeah, Beyond UX kind of came from that experience with mentoring because I just got the same questions over and over and over again um and it seems like there's a lot of people who want to know these things um and uh clearly people are are interested because i've been getting more a more listens than i thought i would uh but you know which is good i mean it's good that people are finding it it's bad people need it but it's good people are finding it um so yeah so that happened in october i started beyond ux design and then now 2023 who knows um you know where where life will take me so Mm -hmm. that's pretty much it yeah that's my story yeah, well, thank Great. you so much for sharing that as well with us, Jeremy. I do have one piggyback question as well to find on that, because you mentioned Beyond UX Design. How did you um, find basically like your third podcast, or how did that go? How did I find my like, like your first interviewee? Oh, um, my first interviewee. Who was my first interview? Uh, my first interview was Casey uh, Randall, I think, for Beyond UX Design. Um, but I actually, he worked with me at that startup years ago. So I've known him for years. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, it's just LinkedIn, honestly, almost every single person that I found networking and stuff was, um, from LinkedIn, Hmm. which, you know, I tell people this all the time, like LinkedIn is just, it's it's not for job hunting only for job hunting. It's not only for, you know, getting your name out there as, as like, like a, a job, um, hunter. Um, it is such a great place to just meet people, learn stuff. You know, it's, it's less toxic than a place like (laughs) Twitter or something like that. You know, people generally are nicer there. Um, but I think, uh, for me, LinkedIn, I've just met so many really cool people. I mean, Chris, you, I mean, I saw I met y'all. I wouldn't let y'all have a winner on LinkedIn. Um, so I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, so, uh, you know, everybody, I mean, um, None of you guys would be here with me today if it wasn't for LinkedIn. Uh, so, you know, I think LinkedIn is just such a really cool spot to just meet people and learn stuff and grow, um, regardless of your profession, to be honest. Um, and that's how I met pretty much every person, aside from Casey, uh, that I've interviewed has been from LinkedIn. Uh, Retro Time is actually a lot of people, random people that have written books and things I've found that way. But anyway. And we do also do have a few questions in chat as well, too. And everybody did like your stories, also very inspiring. I do believe a lot of people like me like to hear more senior UX designers, just how they handled the whole early game process and how they came to about now, because it's really helpful just to let us learn and just piggyback off and stay inspired as designers. Right on. First question in chat, too, from Deep. How do we keep up with the latest trends and developments in UX design, and what resources do we rely on for learning and inspiration? Oh my gosh, I think it all depends on what you're into. Um, yeah. You know, context. Uh, what is it that you're trying to learn? I mean, there's communities everywhere for learning nearly everything. Um, I mean, I think again, LinkedIn. I mean, you're, you're. What are people post? Twitter. What are people posting about all the time? Those are the trends, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the thing I would say is, you know, don't focus too much on the trends. Focus on the fundamentals. And let the trends, you know, maybe supplement those fundamentals. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. user user centered design is fundamental. I mean, it, people are going to stop talking about it over time because it's just going to become cap- table stakes. But you know, and there's always like new software and like yeah. tools coming out all the time too. So. Yeah, you know, the thing I would say about that, like I, I'm telling you right now, Figma is going to get replaced in two or three years by something else. So like, if you focus on the tools and master the tools and how to do a thing it's mad like why do you need to do that thing in that tool and learning why that thing is valuable and understanding you know how do components work why would i want it what are design tokens and how are they valuable and how can they help improve my workflow versus mastering how to do that one specific thing in that tool because yeah. i can i've been doing this for a long time it started off before 
you know, Illustrator or before Photoshop, it was like Quark Express and then Photoshop and then Illustrator, then this and then that. And then, you know, XD or Sketch and then that and then Figma. And now Figma, I'm telling you, Figma is going to go away at some point. I mean, it's only a matter of time. Somebody's going to replace mm -hmm. it. Uh, maybe I don't know. Maybe not. We'll see what Adobe does with it. But uh, my my guess is they're gonna turn it into something completely different. But there's even a contender are. like Framer, who it's yeah. basically direct. As soon as you make the mm -hmm. design and you press play, you have your own website. Yeah, and, and actually was similar. Cool. Yeah, actually did a similar thing to that. You know, so Framer is cool, and and uh, you know, but then it's just about when. Well, why do you need that? Why do you need a website? What is the advantage of that? What does that help you do? Yeah. Right. It's not just to create a website. It's like I can use a website because I can create variables and I can pass variables from from page to page. And that helps me mimic real world functionality so that I can actually get a very, you know, uh, have a have a better usability study or something. Right. Versus mm -hmm. just static images on a screen. Um, and again, it's it's not saying, look, I need to learn Framer. It's why is that tool important and what tools let me do that and what tools do I need for this particular job? Um, so anyway, that's my big advice. Um, trends and stuff, you know, I mean, they're important. Obviously, I feel like the visual design stuff, there's always new trends going on. I can't, I, I'm not the one to answer that question. But um, back in the day, you know, there was like Web Designer Magazine and all these magazines that had all that stuff. And nowadays, there's just websites that have replaced that. There's so. like online newsletters now that you could sign up with like a, quite a few designers. They like to put like little tips and tricks. Yeah, um, I, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I haven't jumped on that band. But to me, it's just like it just floods my inbox with crap and everything gets lost in a sea of newsletters. And then at that point, I, what's the point? Um, yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I, I tend to not get into that. But I don't know, mm -hmm. if you find that valuable, you do it. I mean, that's whatever works for you really is the big thing. If um, I could build on that, too, I tend personally, Tim, to connect with people. And I share a lot of resources with designers, like how we hold in Lab Coat UX, we have weekly design sprints. We typically go over like different tools and knickknacks as we look at each other's works and teach each other things. So you end up learning a lot through actual designers and people instead of just relying on like newsletters and just information. Yeah. Also Twitter. Twitter is a good place too, because they have Twitter spaces for our UX design and mm. different design fields. That's really helpful as well. So I yeah, let me, let me know about that actually, because I, I recently I posted about this LinkedIn, but some I don't know why I got restricted. My, my LinkedIn account was like restricted for like a day or two yeah. um, and it's happened twice and I have no idea why. I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but LinkedIn thinks I'm using some kind of like bots or something, which I'm not. Uh, right. But it, whatever, it doesn't matter. Anyway, so I got on Twitter. I haven't been on Twitter in like a decade. So mm -hmm. all that stuff is like new. So if you have uh, I'm on Twitter now at Jamil's Pays Bills, you can follow me if you want. And uh, if there's anybody worth following or because I'd love to, I'd love to know, let me know what spaces you're in and I'll join you. Yeah, I've got like 15 followers or someone on Twitter right now. But, um, hey, you know, I'll, I'll go drop you a follow on Twitter right now. Dude. Yeah, man, right on, dude. I got you. I got you, bro. Thanks. Thanks, man. Yeah, you may have 15, but you already have like well over 3,000 or so on LinkedIn, right? So a lot uh, of close, getting there. Yeah. Yeah. Getting all there, over. Yeah. yeah. And we so. have a, Few more questions in chat as well too as we go along so let's see so it's from that okay so hi i'm from bangladesh this is from al shiab i hope i'm saying your name right al i don't like to say people's names incorrectly i'm completely new to the ux design field right now i'm looking for an entry-level job or an internship i want to know how much knowledge or skills someone like me would have to get an internship opportunity is it necessary to have a stunning portfolio website to land a job? What will you be your suggestions for people who are depending on remote jobs? That's an amazing question. Uh, let's see. Okay, there's a bunch of questions in there. I just opened up right. So, all right. So the first thing I say is you only need enough to impress that one hiring manager. That's the thing. Like it's uh, it's impossible to give anybody specific advice when it comes to this because every hiring manager is going to have a different set of criteria that they're going to gauge and judge your work, you know, you, the relationship you have with them could could also influence that, right? If they, they might be willing to take a chance if they know you better. So, you know, it all depends. I mean, your, your, your portfolio only has to be good enough to land you a job. That's it. You know, it doesn't have to be the most amazing thing in the world. It, it should, you know, be a tool. It's one tool in a toolbox that you've got to get a job. So um, the knowledge and the skills as an intern, a cursory understanding. I mean, anybody who's looking for five years of experience for an intern is like out of their mind, right? Wait, so, you know, the thing is that people are actually doing that. 
they're doing that. I mean, I've seen like, you know, stuff like Airbnb and, and Etsy that are looking for interns, uh, people that have years of experience. It's crazy. But again, the amount of people applying for these jobs, give them the opportunity to be more choosy and picky. Yeah. If there's somebody with years of experience that is desperate for an internship, you know, Etsy would be crazy not to take that person if, if that person can add value back to the company. So it all depends on the company and the team and the hiring manager. It's impossible to give you like good advice, to exact advice here because it all depends. My advice to everybody when it comes to this kind of stuff is to network, to understand what companies you want to work for and figure out what those companies are looking for and make your resume portfolio, how you interact, like, tailor that to that company and that industry or that that person even, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. because it's impossible to give it. I mean, there's every, the, the thing is right now, UX maturity is so low across the board that there is no standard, you know, there's no standard for this kind of stuff. And if uh, one person thinks one thing, you, that's it, you're done. You know, if somebody else has a different opinion, they might, they might not toss your resume out. So it all depends. It all depends. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's you know, what I, I would add to that if you can meet like designers in your area because like me I live in New York City so I've actually met about two or three designers so far in in-person coffee meets so even if you know somebody you've been talking to for a while in your city or in your new area like hey do you want to meet up and discuss yada 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 that's like mm -hmm. a good way to like network yeah. and like get closer and then just don't approach somebody off the bat immediately on LinkedIn be like hi you're from mm -hmm. this and that company. Can you reference me? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Can you offer right. me job? Yeah, That's exactly. And I know you guys talked with Jeff a couple, Jeff White a couple weeks yeah. ago, and a lot of the tips that he brought up are, are the same tips I would give you. So we don't need to get too far into the networking piece. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think having a relationship with somebody, you know, if you think about just humans in general, right? We trust people we know, right? We don't trust others. We trust people we know in our own kind of little network and our own little clique. So if you can get into that group and, and trust, build trust and relationship with them, they're more likely to take a chance on you. It's sad that you have to do that, but that's just the state of the market right now. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned specifically about having, uh, you know, a, a stunning portfolio or website. I mean, it can't hurt. <laughs> it can't hurt. Mm -hmm. But I think for me as an intern, um, I, or looking at intern, I would, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't, I don't know. I, I, at some point I would probably think like, if it's too nice as an intern, I'd be like, why are you, why are you trying to get an internship? Yeah. You know, so I, I think it's just, you know, it's all, it's all relative. It all depends. Uh, I think the visual design piece will never be a bad thing to go for um, and try to, you know, make that as nice as possible. Um, I don't think it's that hard, you know, go through the material specs and, and just have like a basic understanding of why the principles, like why they lay out things the way they lay out. Why is spacing important? Why is topography and hierarchy of, of information important? Why is color important? You know, you can go through the material specs, you can go through the, the Apple guidelines that do basically the same um, and just understand that at a very bare minimum, you know, yeah. and I think you're, you're, you're already pretty far along. So um, I don't know if that answers. I did that. have a piece of information I read on uh, LinkedIn. I can't remember from who, but they laid down some foundations to making a amazing UX portfolio and they say it's more about like showing rather mm -hmm. than telling so instead of assaulting like your portfolio like a wall of text focus on exactly what you have done and your whole processes and that mm -hmm. would really make you stand out yeah and i think i think also too the big piece though is is not focused necessarily on the what you know it's not just i made this amazing beautiful website um it's there was a need for something and this is how this solved it with this beautiful website Exactly. Have, right. So I think it's all it's all about, again, how you frame the problem and and explaining that. I think having a checklist. I saw a thing on LinkedIn recently was literally somebody had like a checklist of everything a portfolio should have. And it ended up being like 33 things Jeez. like nobody's reading this. I promise, like no hiring managers looking through this. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with the guy, uh, Colton Schweitzer and, and Ludovic Delmas, they, they run a uh, kick-ass UX. It's like a, a boot, not a boot camp, but Yeah, anyway, um, they just offered this thing, um, free program, sign up uh, for how to like, how to make a, a, port a portfolio stand out. And I've talked to both of those guys. And actually, the next episode on Tuesday coming out of Beyond UX is interviewing them. And I think they have some really awesome uh, advice. I think they're solid. They know what they're talking about. Um, and again, it's all about like 
community. It's all about understanding your audience and designing your case study to match the audience you want. And if you are trying to create an, a case study that will apply to 100% of jobs, I can guarantee you 0% of the people looking at them will be impressed. Find the company you want, find the industry that you're passionate about, and create your case study to target that specific audience. And you might limit the number of opportunities, but you will absolutely increase the quality of the conversations you have going forward. I can almost guarantee you that. And we do have a few more questions in chat as well, too. Another one from Karina. They ask, in your opinion, which company slash platform has the best UX so far? If we can start to look up to it as an example. That's a <laughs> That's a very personalized mm, question. <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, I don't know. I, I can't tell you what teams do behind the scenes. You know, I, I can only tell you what their output looks like. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, I think, you know, the, the ones people always think about are Apple, maybe Google. Although the thing with Google, though, is, you know, I think like Google is more of like, if you think about, if you think about how Google does it, they're more about like testing and iterating and trying things and they're not afraid to, to cancel products that just don't work, you know, uh, whereas Apple probably has a more holistic approach. They're more thoughtful and planning, you know, um, you only get updates once, you know, twice a year, right? You don't get constant updates, whereas like on a, every single month or something, you're getting updates to, to different apps on your Android phone. Um, you know, they're not afraid to, to cancel products, whereas Google or a, a, a Apple very rarely does that. Um, you know, so, I mean, I, I honestly, I can't, I can't tell you because I don't know what people do behind the scenes. Um, I would say the ones that work for you are probably the best. I don't know. Um, are you looking at a question about that, about that question is, are you, because you're looking for advice on which companies you want to go like ask for jobs or look and see if they're hiring or are you just curious? I, I, I... Yeah. If you don't want to answer that question. that question, but yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say. It's hard to see what goes on behind the, behind the scenes. Well, if anything, I see. Uh, we have another question. If anything, let me see. Give me one second. What are the essential skills that a new UX designer should possess in today's job market? Yeah, that's and that's today's in today's job market. So here's the thing with in today's job market, right? I believe very strongly that UX and UI are two very different skill sets. I think UX takes a different approach. UI takes a different approach. They are really, to me, two completely different skill sets. Now, I am not saying that you shouldn't do both. I am saying that it, the time comes for the UX and there's a time for the UI. And depending on the company, they might have separate, completely separate teams. They might have one, one team does everything. So the skill sets that you need, I think, depend completely on the company that you want and the job that you want. So my advice to you would be to figure out what you love about this job and do more of that. If that's the visual design, focus on that and find a company that wants visual designers. If you want to be a generalist and you love the end-to-end -end stuff, do that and find the companies that want generalists because you mm -hmm. won't be happy at an enterprise company that has segregated duties, right? If yeah. you really love doing visual design and you get a job as a UX researcher, that's not your job. If you get a job at a startup or small company or even a big company that uses generalists, you'd be more happy. So the skill set that you need needs to be good enough to get you the job that you need. That's like, it all depends. There's no one answer to this question. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to do both, do both. If you want to focus on one, focus on one, but find the companies that are looking for the things you want and then also, go after them. If I was to add on to that, um, when it comes to applying for jobs, you can't just um, rely on like job applications on a website. Mm -hmm. The best way you can get like actual responses is through people. So like networking and actually like yeah. mailing companies and saying, hey, this is what I do, so and so forth. Is there any way I can fit into your company? Just something yeah. simple like that. Just putting yeah. yourself out there I because think, they like to put a face. Yeah, to the and name. again, I know like Jeff talked a lot about networking, but again, this is like, I, I can't stress this enough. Stop applying, stop applying, stop applying to a hundred jobs and sending off thousands of resumes. It is not working. Stop doing it. Stop applying. Start connecting with a human. Find a human. Find the companies you want to work for. Find the humans that work there. Connect with them. Figure out what they want. And then craft your resume, your case studies, and your expertise to what they are looking for. Treat your, treat your website, your resume, your portfolio like any other UX project. There are people that are coming to your site 
to solve a problem. The problem is they need to hire somebody. And if you don't solve their problem, you will not get the job. And mm -hmm. what one person is looking for and the problem one person has could be completely different from somebody else. And that's on you as a UX designer to understand who you who your target audience is and solve their problems. Exactly. And if I was to just add on to that, um, even so companies, most likely they hire somebody that they would know besides for somebody who's just on paper. A lot of the times it's a lot like sourcing. You, they just come to you to just find out more information. Like even for me, it happened like somebody found my website and they were able to see my work because my work was specifically catered to like a certain industry. And then they actually found me through my website and they asked me what I could do. So just to add on what Jeremy said, like you can't just only be like for every single industry, this, that, so-and-so, such and such. Mm -hmm. You focus on what you're strong at and the industries you have been on and you can build from there and it can be convertible skills. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, like that's exactly right. And again, like I mentioned, the kick-ass UX guys, Colton and, and Ludovic, this is something that they're, I think they're going to talk about in that thing. But again, you know, for me, I love enterprise. I'm never, I'm never going to apply to Facebook because I just have no desire to work there. And they probably wouldn't like my portfolio anyway because it doesn't meet what they're looking for. Exactly. But I can guarantee you another enter giant enterprise company would look at me like, oh, wow, he knows what he's doing because he's done this. So, you know, find those companies, the industries, whatever, healthcare, food, doesn't matter, education, whatever you want, you know, you're probably not going to be happy working. If you're in the healthcare, you're probably not going to be happy working at a cigarette company, right? So why would you try to like make it to where whatever UX team would want to hire you, right? Like it's not what you want. So focus, like I'm not saying niche down and like as far as like your skill set goes, you can be a generalist if you want, but niche down in, in the industry that you really care about and show those companies that you can do that work. Exactly. And I completely agree. Well, if there aren't any more questions, anyone, I would like to thank you all today for coming to our podcast and especially thank you, Jeremy, not Mr. Miller, today thank for you, giving us the input on his side and how he led to his journey. So yeah, we do thank you for coming. Also, be sure to check out his podcast over here, which will be Beyond UX Design. It is very helpful for you to get more industry knowledge and hear more input from other designers and what's going on and just the general layout of the field. I've also linked those as well in the chat and also to Jeremy's LinkedIn. Yeah, so, yeah. I, uh, I try to post daily about fun, interesting things. So if you want to learn fun and interesting things uh follow me on linkedin yeah, and maybe twitter too if you want to i don't know do, i can't guarantee right do. on, dude. yeah i can't guarantee my twitter or my tweets will be nearly as insightful as the linkedin post but i do what i can with 280 characters or less so awesome awesome we definitely look forward to that chat that you're having when at, with kick out kick ux uh, it'll be tuesday i'm, I'm gonna drop it maybe monday afternoon depends how quick i get it out but Awesome. And we'll definitely have that post up there for everyone. So we do thank you all for coming and thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank we you, will Jeremy. see you guys. Yeah, you have a great day. All right. Bye, all. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. See you later, Jeremy. Bye, y'all.